on a special Too Blessed to be Stressed. People's lives totally destroyed. But it's like a war zone around here. Their lives here in New Orleans has been totally devastated. Eight months after Katrina, Marla and the Too Blessed production crew traveled to New Orleans to see the recovery efforts for ourselves. And this is the ending result of the devastation. We're here in New Orleans where the Hurricane Katrina eight months ago destroyed thousands of lives in this community. We will be interviewing residents that are here rebuilding this community, such as Jay Baroni, who's a local contractor who is working to rebuild the devastation and the total destruction of this community. You will also see some of the residents such as the House of Blues and Dwayne and others who are taking a part in this local restructuring, rebuilding, revitalizing, and bringing people back and life back to this community here in New Orleans. In August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall near New Orleans in Louisiana. While spared a direct hit from the eye of the hurricane, the storm surge still overwhelmed the levee system that protected the city. But everybody knew these levees wasn't built to stop that kind of water surge that came through. Seventeen separate levee breaks flooded over 80% of the city. The people who chose to ride out the storm found themselves trapped by the rising waters. When I think of Katrina, that's what I think of, is seeing the people stuck on their roofs, waving out the windows in their attic, you know, yelling for help, somebody help them. Seeing people on top of roofs, seeing the water, you know, seeing the helplessness. Matter of fact, most of the people that died back here were the older people. They say, well, we survived Betsy, so we'll do this. You, you see it, and you see it going on, and it's just mind-boggling, you know. I, I literally did feel like I was watching a movie, you know. It's like, is this actually is going on here in the United States, you know. Why? We are the United States of America. Why are these people suffering? After several days of chaos, tens of thousands of New Orleans residents were evacuated to other parts of the country, including East Tennessee. Uh, I, I drove for Knoxville Area Transit, and uh, a lot of me evacuated to the airport, and uh, we were picking them up, you know, in the buses and stuff, and they, uh, took some of the buses off of our normal routes and stuff to help those people out and, and uh, seeing them come in and you know all they have was just a bag with them you know or a paper bag or a plastic bag and that was all they had. You can't be a human and see that kind of suffering and pain and not want to reach out some kind of way. More than eight months after Katrina the recovery efforts continue. Only a third of the population of the city has returned and many of the businesses and services are still not functioning at full capacity. After a previous interview with a couple from New Orleans who evacuated to Knoxville, the Too Blessed To Be Stressed production crew traveled to New Orleans to see the recovery efforts for ourselves. A mind cannot prepare for such pain, such chaos, and such tragedy. When you get down there, you finally realize I think the power of this storm. It's been over eight months and these these neighborhoods, just neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood are just abandoned. This car probably doesn't even belong here. You can see the child's pencil, their little scissors, and the tape dispenser. You can even see the lip chap that they used. Until then did the reality that this was people's life. Until then, it really didn't set in. The light bulb didn't go off. I literally felt like I was in a ghost town. They were completely gone. I'll never forget that, seeing four porches in a row with no houses behind them. How do you restore from the brokenness of the devastation? 
people's lives totally destroyed. Matter of fact, as we was walking along down at the lower ninth ward, I continually had to pinch myself to make sure that this was a reality, that it wasn't a dream. A child's bicycle, their lives, their memories. How do you replenish this? I can't imagine how. You know what I mean? It hurt to come back here, and I don't want to come back, but I have to. Something just drove me, I mean, like I'll ride through here. What's up, dog? What's up, what's up? You know what I'm saying? Just holler at people. And I, and I wish I could go through that again, but it ain't happening, because ain't nobody here. And then walked outside and saw a little toy doll laying in the street, and for me, that was, you know, that's the whole community, not just the houses, but the churches and the restaurants they ate in. The gas stations, they buy their gas and their complete lives just gone. This is the local church where families in this community came together and worshiped, met, ate together, fellowshiped. It says, can these dry bone live? These are the plates, I'm sure, that many of them that had their Sunday dinner ate on. This is some of the devastation, eight months left. The number on the bottom of these homes show the number of lives that was inside of the house that did not survive. When we went to the St. Bernard Parish and we looked in the stores that were there and the clothes are still just hanging on the racks. That's, that's probably the thing that I'm walking away with, the image I'm walking away with the most, is those clothes just hanging on the racks like time had stand, had had moved. Seeing the McDonald's across the street ripped apart. I mean, a McDonald's, you know, <laughs> it's such a, oh, you see them everywhere you go. They're in every town, on every highway across America, and no one's eating their hamburgers, no one's ordering fries. It's just sitting there. You knew it had to be unlivable. There is no way a human being could tolerate the stench, no less the living of uh, quarters. There was no living quarters, you know. And, and if it doesn't touch your heart and seeing that and make you appreciate life a whole lot more, then there's got to be something wrong. What amazing, amazing people to, to stick with it, that not all left, not all, you know, some people love it that much, that they're willing to stay and put up with not being able to get groceries at the same hour, the restaurant's not open all night, we couldn't find anywhere to eat after a certain hour, things that are normally open till 1 a.m., you know, closing at 9 and 10, and, and putting up with all of those things till life becomes somewhat normal again. So I believe people are going to come back, you know. I believe my city will come back. There is a peace that surpasses all understanding. It surpasses our rationality. It's a the past, all of our knowledge and our reasoning, and that's what God gave those people. And I've seen it as I interviewed them and talked to them. There resided in them a peace that surpassed all of the madness. I don't think you can come back from there and not feel gratitude, no matter what money problems, family problems, we still have all those stresses in our lives. Every day, getting to work, getting kids to school. I was so grateful to have those. <laughs> I was so grateful to have those that morning. And I feel like, um, you know, my perspective has broadened a little bit. I hope I'm a better person for that trip. When we return, we will be interviewing Jay Baroni. He will show us some of the devastating destruction here in New Orleans. We're talking with Jay Baroni, who is one of the local contractors in New Orleans, who is going to walk us through one of the homes of the total devastating destruction that we have seen here in New Orleans. Jay, it is so good to be here with you today, to be able to come down and visit here in New Orleans, uh, here in the Lakewood, Lake South subdivision. That's what this community is, right? Right. Lakewood the, Lake, South. the Lakewood South subdivision. And uh, here at this resident here, what is this street here, Jay? Uh, Marsha. Marsha, Marsha Street. Marsha Avenue. Good. Right. And so this is one of the homes that 
Right. This is one of the homes that got flooded. Um, it was water to the ceiling. To the ceiling. To the ceiling. And it's just a typical of what hundreds of thousands of houses look like in New Orleans. Let's go in. And this okay. is, Jay. Okay. This is typically what the house looks like after we've gutted it all out. We've taken all the electric out. As you see, some of the fixtures are still here. Uh, Sheetrock, insulation, just about everything in the house has to be torn out. Oh, um, this would have been what, Jay? This was the formal living room. That was a formal dining room. Now, when we got in here, you have to realize the furniture just floated everywhere. The refrigerator in this house wound up over here in the den. Tables were floating. Everything was just thrown over like big hands just lifted it up and just dropped it in a pile. That's, it's, it's what it looked like. It had um, to be total devastation. Oh, yeah, because by the time we got in here, it was, oh, about a month later, it was full of mold and mildew. Um, to come in a house like this, you have to wear a respirator, protective clothing, gloves. Right. You know, it was... Uh, so how have you got it to this point? Now, you are J.B. Morona Construction. Right. You've been in business since 1989 right. here in this community. How did, and I think this is one of the homes you own, Right. but you are doing a lot of rebuilding and refurbishing and some of the other ones that you will be showing us later. Right. How do you get it to the point where we don't have to have respirators and things? Okay, what we did once we got all the furniture, carpet drywall insulation totally out we air the house out for about a week then we come in with a real strong solution of bleach wash the whole house down from ceiling to floor we let that dry then there's a product out called Boracare that we come in and spray afterwards that prevents mold and mildew from regrowing right right and you know, that brings us to the stage where we're at now to start rebuilding. Now, I bet that is important that the mildew, let's go here. Now, oh, what yeah. would have this been? Well, this was, this was part of the den. Okay. Um, the other part of the den looked out over the pool area. Um, is this some of the original flooring? This flooring was just put down about a year before the storm. It's all ceramic tile. In fact, the whole house was renovated about a year before the storm. Oh, man. Um, so this was the den area of the was, home? This was the original den. This was? The kitchen with the breakfast area. And um, like I said, everything in the house was... was so you there. gutted, you had to gut everything. Everything comes off. Uh, ceilings, walls. Uh, we're able to save some of the air conditioning system. The compressor unit has to be replaced. The whole house has to be rewired again because the water was up high enough to affect everything. And it went to the ceiling? Uh, actually, in this portion of the house, it was above the ceiling. It was up to the ceiling in the main part of the house. This was like a little plant room that we added on to overlook the pool. Now, how do you keep uh, the mildew and the moist and stuff from coming back into the joists? Okay, that was the product that we spray after we use the Boracare. The, the, the Boracare. Right. Okay. All right, and it prevents any mold or mildew from, from com supposedly now, ever growing again. Uh, is there any OSHA um, stipulations or no, for the contractors um, here? No, what we're doing, we get a what they call a mold mediation company. They come in, they test for mold to see if there's any mold, residue, or spores left in the house. Right. And right. once you get a certificate saying that you know the house is mold free then like you can begin to then we can begin you know reconstruct the house and Jay the resident that lived here um, I'm sure this is where them and their families did you know them personally oh yeah the these, residents that lived here yeah these were real good friends of mine and them and their children enjoyed the pool I'm sure right um, their children their grandkids it was a beautiful yard back here it was just landscaped yeah, it was really, it was, it was, so it was a beautiful here. place. It was. Look, nothing like this, Jay. No, <laughs> no. Um, I tell you, it was heartbreaking knowing that I did all the work and what the place used to look like. And to come back. And to come back. These people never did come back. They, I, I sent them pictures, and once they saw the pictures, they, they just, never they, came back. they had no ambition to come back, no. Um, now, this was the pool house. That was the pool cabana. Um, we had just just renovated that oh just a couple months before the storm we had turned it into a workout room and uh, 
you know, Mrs. Hausman, you know, this is where she did all her exercising. And, um, but everything got shuffled around. There was a greenhouse back here, and it got yes, shoved around. How beautiful, how beautiful. Um, so it was, I'm surprised it was, it's still standing. Yeah, yeah, I think what kept it standing is it just couldn't float around that much, and it was protected from the wind. I think, you know, as you can see, the fences got all torn up. Yeah. Um, the wind was really strong here. So this has been a devastating thing to oh. the residents. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, so many people put their whole worth in the material things. That's true, Jay. But it's given us a chance now for me to talk to them, to tell them, you know, material things can be gone tomorrow. Yeah, and, and now they can really see. And it's opened plenty of doors to talk to people. You're rebuilding and restructuring and helping people to restore their lives. Right, and in plenty of areas, we're just helping to restore their lives because they, they can't even rebuild. Yeah, yeah. You know? All right, okay. joined by Dwayne, the program director with the WWOZ radio station, a local radio station here in New Orleans. They had a wonderful event last night at the House of Blues where they brought in local and national entertainers for a fundraising event for this great radio station. We are here today, Dwayne. Thank you. We're at the House of Blues with Dwayne Brashear <laughs> in New Orleans, right? New Orleans, New got it. Dwayne is the director, program director for WWOZ, mm -hmm. which is a local radio station here, FM station mm -hmm. in New Orleans. What is all of this about, Wayne? This is all about keeping the music of the city alive, the culture of the city alive. WWOZ is a non-profit, non-commercial radio station that focuses on keeping the music and the culture of the city and the region alive. You know, and in light of everything that we've had to deal with these last eight, nine months, you know, it's very important to us to keep that going. The venue that we've used in the past was damaged by the hurricane and then vandalized afterwards. House of Blues was great enough to say, you guys, we have a place for you to have your event. Come on over here, let's keep this going. Well, this is a big fundraiser for WWOC, which is the local New Orleans Heritage Radio Station, a nonprofit radio station that raises money to stay in existence and they broadcast 24 hours a day and they play wonderful New Orleans music and they're just committed to the culture of Louisiana and and so we support them in whatever way we can. So this is a fundraiser for the WWOZ. It's a FM station here, a nonprofit. What are the funds? What, how much will you all raise from this, Dwayne? I'm guessing if I'm we're lucky, we'll raise about forty to fifty thousand dollars. Oh man, that's great! And what would the funds go towards? Towards uh, keeping this all alive. I mean, like this point in time, all of our music is in Baton Rouge right now, so we're relying on the new stuff that's coming out and music that our volunteers have. All of our DJs are volunteers. Once we get through this, we're going to focus on digitizing our music library. We have like twenty to thirty thousand CDs. Man. Sitting in Baton Rouge right now at uh, LPB, Louisiana Public Broadcasting, they're going to help us digitize all of it so that we never have to worry about losing our library again. I mean, yeah. Katrina made us realize what's important, and um, there's a risk of losing, you know, 40, 50 years of, of music. And we were fortunate we didn't lose anything musically, now we need to make sure we preserve it. Would you say this is one of New Orleans' landmarks? Oh, definitely. We've been here 12 years and we're so committed to the city. We're so honored to be back and to be able to be open and open for business and have music. 
it's just incredible after all we've been through to see the support that locals have for music yeah, and, and yeah. just that healing power of music is just incredible so we are trying our best to add to the whole flavor of recovery. How did this Katrina, how did this whole hurricane affect the House of the Blues? Well it affected everyone here. I mean we had 230 employees prior to the hurricane. We're down to like a hundred now. Oh, man. Um, and you know we closed from August 29th until we reopened in December. So you all just 12th. opened yeah. in December? In okay. December and we featured some live music and we were so ecstatic to see the local support. All of our shows sold out so um, you know, we realized right then and there that we had to reopen and had to recover and, and just add. As you can see, this block is a lot of um, mine and pa kind well, of businesses. Yes, yes. So we add as an anchor um, to, these, to this block and to the French Quarter as well. So this is some of you all are playing a major part oh, yeah. of the rebuilding. Oh, yeah. Oh, by lies. just rehiring a lot of employees, yeah. giving musicians another gig to play, yeah, featuring yeah. local bands, okay, and like this night tonight, which is almost all local music, it's just adding to the recovery effort, and then supporting a, an organization like WWZ, it just, it just makes us, um, it's one step towards normal rebuilding. recovery and rebuilding. I mean, it's not normal. I don't think it's ever going to be normal again. It's kind of a new reality for all of us here in New Orleans. I bet. I really, really appreciate you at the spare of a moment taking uh -huh. the time. I'm uh -huh. just surprised of, in the midst of just 10 months ago yeah. of the ultimate of being stressed, yeah. you know, how your city, as a matter of fact, I admire you as a woman, um, how you all have, I, I do, as a woman, as a businesswoman, and as a community leader that is bringing other communities such as the radio stations and yeah. other artists to come together, you know, to rebuild your city and take back what Katrina thought right. it had taken. Right. So I admire you and well, I thank you. you so much. I really so appreciate much. this appreciate interview. That. Thank you. At the end of each show, Weekly, we give you a word of wisdom, and as you see the devastation that has happened to the lives of the people in New Orleans, my word of wisdom to you this week is, life is like a river. It flows where it must, but not where we always want it to. We'll see you next week. Too Blessed to Be Stressed has been sponsored by Sam's Club, Walmart, B97.5, The Thomas Group, Lamar Advertising, and Regus Restaurant. On the next Too Blessed to Be Stressed television show. We continue our special series on Hurricane Katrina and the recovery of New Orleans as we talk with a New Orleans evacuee here in Knoxville and the family that helped her and her family 